neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to change in response to experience. In fact, neuroplasticity underlies all forms of learning, whether or not it's language learning or learning music or math or a physical skill. All forms of learning involve the reorganization of connections in the nervous system, the brain and spinal cord and body. One of the key principles of neuroplasticity is this notion of making errors as a good thing. But what the scientific literature tells us is that whenever we're trying to learn something new, if we make an error, we know it feels frustrating, but that state of frustration actually cues up particular brain areas to be more alert so that on subsequent attempts to learn that thing, we have a heightened level of focus and a higher probability of learning the new skill, regardless of what that skill is. And I've talked about this before in various episodes as encouraging people to embrace errors or pursue errors, not as their own end goal, but errors as an entry point for making the brain more plastic. And if you think about it, it really makes sense. Why would the brain change at all if it's performing everything perfectly? When you make errors, well, in the immediate seconds and minutes after those errors, you are in a better position to learn. You may be an athlete. You might not be an athlete. You might want to learn how to dance. You might not. You might want to learn how to dance and get better at remembering and learning languages, for instance, or at unlearning some difficult emotional experience. The way to create plasticity is to send signals to the brain that something is wrong, something is different, and something isn't being achieved. And I think this will completely reframe the way that most people think about plasticity. Most of us think about plasticity as, okay, we're going to get into this optimal learning state or flow, and then suddenly we're going to be able to do all the things that we wish that we could do. Well, I hate to break it to you, but flow is an expression of what we already know how to do. It is not a state for learning. Flow is an expression of nervous system capabilities that are already embedded in us. Errors and making errors out of sync with what we would like to do is how our nervous system is cued through very distinct biological mechanisms that something isn't going right and therefore certain neurochemicals are deployed that signal the neural circuits that they have to change. So let's talk about the experiments that support what I just said because I'm about to tell you that making errors over and over and over again is the route to shaping your nervous system so that it performs better and better and better. A common question I get, however, is what should be the rate of errors, which is really just a way of saying how hard should the given task be that you're trying to learn or perform? And it turns out there's an answer. There's a recent paper that was published in a great journal, Nature Communications. This is a paper, a last author, Jonathan Cohen. And the paper is entitled The 85% Rule for Optimal Learning. Basically, what this paper shows is that when trying to learn something new, you want to make the difficulty of what you're trying to learn such that you're getting things right about 85% of the time, that you're making errors about 15% of the time. And, and I want to emphasize about 15% of the time because there's no way to configure protocols for sport or language or math or anything else where you're going to have exactly 15% of errors. So this paper, the 85% rule for optimal learning, points to the idea of making things pretty hard, but not so hard that you're failing every attempt or even half of the attempts. Failing about 15% of the time seems optimal for learning. If you're teaching, keep in mind that you want to keep the students reaching for higher and higher levels of proficiency in whatever that is that you're teaching, and that 15% of the time they should be failing. If it gets to 20%, that's probably okay. If they start failing about half the time, then probably what they're trying to learn is too difficult for them at that point. The brain is incredibly plastic from about birth until about age 25, and then somewhere about 25. It's not like the day after your 26th birthday, plasticity closes. There's a kind of tapering off of plasticity, and you need different mechanisms to engage plasticity as an adult. I got a lot of questions about, well, what about if I'm younger than 25? When you're young, your brain is very plastic, but you have less control over your experience. When you're older, generally, you have more control over your experience, but your brain is less plastic. Get the broadest education you can possible. Math, chemistry, physics, literature, music, learn how to play an instrument. Get a broad training in a number of things and find the thing that really uh, captures your passion and excitement. Each of us have some natural times throughout the day when we are going to be much better 
at tolerating these errors and much more focused. But chances are that you can't focus as well at 4 p.m. as you can at 10 a.m. It differs for everybody depending on when you're sleeping and your kind of natural chemistry and rhythms. But find the time or times of day when you naturally have the highest mental acuity. And that's really when you want to engage in these learning bouts. And then get to the point where you're making errors and then keep making errors for seven to 30 minutes. Just keep making those errors and drill through it. And you're almost seeking frustration. And if you can find some pleasure in the frustration, yes, that is a state that exists. You have created the optimal neurochemical milieu for learning that thing. You also have created the optimal milieu for learning other things afterward adult nervous system can tolerate smaller and smaller errors over time, but that you can stack those errors so that you can get a lot of plasticity. Incremental learning as an adult is absolutely essential. You are not going to get massive shifts in your representations of the outside world. So how do you make small errors as opposed to big errors? Well, the key is smaller bouts of focused learning for smaller bits of information. It's a mistake to try and learn a lot of information in one learning bout as an adult. Adult nervous system is fully capable of engaging in a huge amount of plasticity, but you need to do it in smaller increments per learning epoch or per learning episode. There are some beautiful studies published in Cell Reports last year and the year before showing that people who take a 20 minute nap within the four hours after these uh, triggering learning or people that do a non-sleep deep rest type protocol, even just sitting there quietly and not doing anything, they learn much faster. These shallow naps of 20 to 30 minutes also create a replay or a firing of the neurons. It's it's supposed to be stressful to learn. It's this idea that we just sit back and learn or that, you know, movies have really destroyed the notion of learning. The idea that you're going to like pick up the sword and suddenly have the skills, you know, forget it. It's like, this just doesn't work that way. I mean, it's friction, 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 friction. Some days are good and some days are worse. If you slept better, generally it's better. People are always trying to optimize how much caffeine, background noise, yes noise, yes music, no music. You have to tweak things according to your circumstances. But you, nine, after about 90 minutes, you should really take a break and let your mind go idle somewhat. Ideally, you would take a 20-minute nap or a 30-minute nap or do a non-sleep deep rest protocol within the first hour to four hours after that. But a lot of us have a lot of demands. You go straight from a 90-minute bout to commuting. Sleep that you get that night is going to be the most powerful tool for wiring the nervous system. But there's another thing that you can do. There's a beautiful literature on what's called gap learning effects. And this has been looked at for physical skill learning, for music learning, math, etc. Where if every couple of minutes, just randomly during your intense learning or focus, you pause and you just take 10 seconds and do nothing. Just let your brain idle. Eyes open or eyes closed. Doesn't matter. What happens is your rates of learning actually increase. And the reason is, and now they've done neuroimaging on this, show that during those little gaps that you're taking, there's a replay of the neurons very fast at something like 10 or 20x the speed that the, normally they would be rehearsing it. So you're getting more repetitions during the, by, by stopping every once in a while. Now you actually have to do the work and how many of these to insert, and it should be random. So there are some free apps out there where you can set like a random buzzer or just every once in a while while you're writing or trying to do something, you just pause and do nothing. Let's just make up a number for fun so people have something to, to anchor to. If you're going to sit down and do an hour of work, let's say for every 60 minutes of focus or learning that you try and do, introduce um, 30, 30 gaps of 10 seconds at random and, and truly at random, not a, on a regular interval. And then sometime later that day, if you can, do an NSDR, non-sleep deep rest. And if you can't, Okay, no big deal. You won't learn as fast, but you'll still learn, provided that you get into deep sleep that night. Let's say you have a lousy night's sleep. You'll still learn, but you won't learn as well. And maybe the next night you stand a chance of encoding that information. 